Disclaimer! The following episode contains spoilers for THE Suicide Squad. Don't go crying to your mum if we spoil it for you. You've been warned! Welcome to Pod Capers, the official podcast for a place to hang your cape. And this week, I've been waiting for this film for five fucking years! We're talking about THE Suicide Squad! Cue the music! Hello there, capers, and as I said, welcome to Pod Capers, the official podcast of a place to hang your cape. My name's Scott James Merridue, and this is the show where we talk about various geek and nerd related topics, and I'm joined each week by a very special different guest. He's been on the show before. Give it up, capers, for Francisco Andrade. How are you doing, Francisco? Doing really good. Thanks for having me. I'm very glad that you're here because I need to take you, Francisco, a little journey into the past with me. <laughs> on this journey to the past. Anyway, so the very first podcast I was ever on, my first appearance ever, was on this podcast called the Jock and Nerd Podcast. The great friends of the show. We love them. They're great. And I said definitively, I hate DC. I don't like the DCEU. But I think the Suicide Squad movie, you know, that upcoming movie, 2016, uh, directed by David Ayers, I think that movie is going to be really good. It's got an interesting premise, great actors, great characters. And David Ayers, like, he's a well-established director. He knows what he's doing. Surely there's no way that this could end up badly. I ended up eating my words somewhat. (laughs) And I had that albatross across my neck for five years. I made a prediction, and it was completely wrong. Now, however, I feel like I am somewhat vindicated. This is the movie I should have seen in 2016. This is the movie we all should have gotten. We just got it late, and we needed James fucking Gunn to deliver. And boy, did he deliver. Oh my god, it was amazing. James Gunn really outdid himself with this one. And I was hoping it was going to be good. I thought it was going to be going to be good. And it's so weird that we got this movie because of a kerfuffle between James Gunn and Disney. That That, that is so bizarre to me. that it's, it's like this weird butterfly domino effect that led us to this moment. This glorious, weird, insane, wacky, gory moment. I know, and he, he really... I, I was surprised about the gore, I think, most of all. Because, you know, you watch movies like Guardians of the Galaxy, and you're like, okay, it's silly, and it's irreverent, the teamwork, and you can kind of see where James Gunn is going with this. And then and then he got this one, it's like he was directing, like, DC Universe Saw at some points. Like, it's insane. Well, he had a history with horror. I don't know if you've ever seen this movie he did. I think it was called Slither. I... I think I've heard of it. I don't know if I've seen that one. It actually had uh, both Michael Rooker, who's a longtime collaborator of his, and mm. uh, Nathan Fillion, who's also in this movie, in it. And I- it's a very good movie. I don't, I'm not a big horror guy, but it's a very good movie. It's all about these alien parasites that sliver into people and it causes all sorts of... This, it's got this weird like body horror thing going on. It's a lot of fun. And <laughs> I guess he just took that mindset and went, whole hog, yeah, we'll have Flula Borg in there. We'll have... <laughs> Fucking a giant starfish, but we are getting ahead of ourselves. Before we even begin to talk about the Suicide Squad, we need to talk about the news! So a lot of um, superhero-esque related news, but first of all, before we need to talk about we need to talk about how Disenchanted, the long-awaited sequel to the Disney movie Enchanted, has officially wrapped filming. Uh, being that Enchanted is one of the few Disney movies that I can tolerate, I- admittedly though it's a live-action movie and my tolerance for them is usually higher, uh, I just saw, actually, the other day when I saw Suicide Squad, um, I saw Jungle Cruise, have you seen that movie? I haven't got a chance to see it yet. It is absolutely, positively fine. It's fine. <laughs> like, it's, that seems the case with most new Disney movies, is that they, they, they're topping out at... Yeah, so I, that's a, definitely a movie I've watched. 
Honestly, the best thing you do with Jungle Cruise, I mean, the movie's fine. If you want to go and see it, I'm not going to say don't go and see it. But the best thing about that movie is the uh, interviews with the cast because they all have this great chemistry and they're constantly taking the piss out of each other in a really fun way. Like Dwayne Johnson and Emily Blunt actually have pretty insane chemistry. So that's a lot of fun. Uh, But Disenchanted, I'm interested to see what they do with a story about a Disney princess who ends up having to live in the real world and is confronted with real problems for the first time (laughs) in her life, I'm assuming. I'm interested to see where that goes. Hopefully it'll be good. It's Disney. I'm not holding my breath. In other news that is somewhat related to this movie, in that it's a a person who was in this movie, Taika Waititi is going to be making a Flash Gordon movie. It was previously announced that he was going to do a... Uh, animated Flash Gordon movie. You find this out for the first time. <laughs> he was going to be. He was going to be doing an animated movie, but now he's going to be switching to live action. I mean, I don't know, man. I mean, the director of Thor Ragnarok doing Flash Gordon. Can you see that working? Yes, of course you can. Oh my god, that'd be amazing! I can't wait. I bet you. Uh, I know Seth MacFarlane is like the biggest Flash Gordon fan. I'm surprised he doesn't have his hands in there somewhere. That's a very good point, actually. I'm surprised <laughs> he hasn't done that. He's busy doing the Orville. Uh, they're working on season three of that. I'm looking forward to that as well. But no, I mean, Tiger Woods is the perfect guy to do a Flash Gordon movie. There have been several abortive attempts to try and bring Flash Gordon back into the mainstream over the years. Obviously, there was the 80s movie. Uh, there was a couple of cartoons. There was also a live-action TV show at some point. I think it was on the Sci-Fi Channel. No one saw it. No one cared. It's very much a throwback. But if anyone could breathe new life into it, it's Taika Waititi. In my mind, the man can do very little wrong, if indeed any. He's so loved right now. He's in everything. He was in Suicide Squad. (laughs) Exactly, yeah. Uh, He hasn't fully committed to directing the film, but he's definitely involved with production. So either way, it's going to be very interesting. Uh, In more, again, superhero-esque news, there is going to be an upcoming Blue Beetle movie, and it is going to be star in the role of Jaime Reyes, um, an actor from Cobra Kai called, and I'm going to get this name wrong, I do apologize, Sholo Maridune? Duene? Duena? From from Cobra Cobra Kai, right? Uh, Yeah. I don't remember how to say his name either. Which I'm, is bad I'm, because I'm Hispanic. <laughs> oh, oh what? You see, when I do it, it's because I'm full of white privilege. When you're doing it, it's a betrayal. <laughs> yeah, it's really bad. But I am super excited about that because I am the... I, I wish I would have known we were talking about this. I actually have, like, the Beatle from... I love... Jaime Reyes, he's 100% one of my favorite DC characters. He's definitely, I mean, he's, I wouldn't say he's one of my favorite, but he's one of those ones that I do genuinely like. I read some of the issues of the comic he was in, saw him some other miscellaneous material, like um, Young Justice and Injustice 2. And he, he was always striking me as one of those just inherently likable characters. He's got this real, like, Spider-Man quality about him, yeah. which I really like. And so I just wish more characters like him were given center stage in the DC. EU earlier instead of yet another Superman movie and I, just Batman v Superman and all that shit. I th- I don't know. It's it's funny because Marvel went the funny route. They went the route of let's make people laugh and let's make people feel in that sense. And then DC for some reason just stuck with like Nolan and Zack. <laughs> Not even in and- directing. Just like Nolan's great. Yeah, but this is the thing. You see. Marvel understood. I mean, not all the Marvel films are laugh out loud riots all the time, but they understood that in order for us to care about these characters, we need to develop an emotional connection. And that can work sometimes, but when you have all of your characters being broody and grim, it doesn't work. This is why people connected so much with the Aquaman, Shazam, and Wonder Woman movie, because those characters actually bothered to smile every once in a while. Exactly, and I and I think that really worked in their favor because it, like people complained the first time around about how Batman was the one making jokes in the Justice League movie. Well, and I was like, yeah. like somebody needs to. <laughs> yeah, God damn it! If we don't, we're just going to get seasonal affective disorder just from watching the movie. <laughs> Jesus! And then we see the Flash making jokes, and it's just like, actually, no. Can we go back to Batman making jokes, please? <laughs> Anything to shut this guy up? Oh my God. But, I'm glad Zack Snyder took another shot at that one. 
Absolutely. <laughs> well, uh, I've got my opinions on that. Anyway, uh, so hopefully, I mean, it looks like the DCEU has basically just crumbled apart of the scenes. But the good news is we now get to do what Marvel's oddly enough doing before the MCU, which is just standalone films. Uh, they don't have to be connected. We could just enjoy movies just with these singular characters. And honestly, if they're good movies... I don't really care about that. One thing I do care about, though, is the sudden influx of ads that are just everywhere in our lives. Like this one right now. Enjoy! And now we're pleased to bring you our feature presentation. Oh, God. So before we even get started, we need to just briefly for the sake of our sanity, recap the previous Suicide Squad movie. Everything went down. I mean, suicide, the Suicide Squad for movie, I think, the original one, Suicide Squad, we're going to have to... Suicide Squad, the shit one. We're going to have to find some way to differentiate. <laughs> uh, um, that movie for me was one of those ones where the individual parts could have been quite good, but they were combined in such a weird way. It's... I, it was like a trifle where half the ingredients were in the bin and the other half were layered wrong. And it's just like, why have I got like three layers of Ladyfinger sponge before we even get to the jam? I don't I don't understand. Why would you arrange that in this way? And there's multiple reasons for that. I think there was an inherent misunderstanding about what these characters are, what this team is and what they do. I also think that there was an intense desire ironically enough, to make the film more like Guardians of the Galaxy, which didn't work. No. There was, And there were some ideas that just wouldn't have worked anyway, like Enchantress and just introducing characters that had, like, we're going to die. Like, we're going, like big, huge, like, <laughs> the dark mark just over them. Like, they introduce, like, all these characters get a bunch of cool, flashy intros. And then there's this one guy who's... <laughs> Superpower is ropes, oh, and yeah. we don't even know his name. And I'm just thinking, like, well, you're dead. <laughs> you're going to be the literal first one to die. It was and so that, obvious. That was my biggest gripe about it, is that you could look at that movie from a mile away and be like, okay, obviously Will Smith, Margot Robbie, and Jared Leto aren't going to die, at least not in the beginning. So what are we even here for? Like, yeah. the, There was no suspense. Trouble. Yeah, nobody knew who Diablo was. You know he was going to die. Nobody knew like who this guy was. Of course he was going to die. And he just kept doing that. And it, yeah. there was no... It just kept asking you to stick in, even though you knew what the ending of the movie looked like. And the characters that did live were grossly misrepresented. Harley Quinn... Like, okay, you can interpret a character in different ways in films and stuff. You're allowed to try new things. But when one of Harley Quinn's biggest biggest character development is escaping from an abusive relationship with the Joker, you have zero right to then turn around and make it like, oh no, it's actually true love. No. No. Disrespectful. How dare you? Took birds of prey to try and fix that. God, I missed that movie as well. Um, then you've got something like... Uh, <laughs> then you've got Deadshot, whose whole thing in the comics is he's a remorseless, methodical, amoral killer who will murder anyone. And in the movie, it's just like, would you ever kill a mother or a child? And he was like, oh, no. Oh, God, no. I never kill women and children. <laughs> Hate to break it to you, fans of that movie. In the comics, he is always doing that. He once killed a kid just because he his actual target was the kid's father, and he didn't want the kid to one day seek vengeance against him. And he didn't give it a second thought. But he loved his daughter. That was the unique part of the character. He he didn't care about anyone else. He just cared about his kid and genuinely loved her. And that made such an interesting character. Like, how do you reconcile that sort of morality in your own mind? And there was and Will Smith could have done that. Imagine Will Smith as a bad guy. Like that would have been interesting. They just it's didn't want to commit. They didn't want to commit to bad no. guys being bad guys. And that was the whole movie. And Harley Quinn, you wanted to feel bad for her. And the only true bad guy in that movie was the Joker. And and even then, it was like poorly. He was not even bad. He was just like crazy. And not in the good Joker crazy. He was just literally like 
my girlfriend left me. I got to kill her. <laughs> it yeah, it's... A, it, uh, yeah, it left a lot to be desired, to say the least. There was, a, there was a ton of stuff that just didn't work. I don't think the direction was great, despite David Ayers. Oh, remember when David Ayers, the premiere, said, fuck Marvel? Like, oh, no, 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 we changed the game, guys. No, you didn't. No, you fucking didn't. <laughs> it was just a massive disappointment from start to finish. And worst of all, I think the ch- chief cardinal sin this movie made was it made Amanda Waller look stupid. Oh my God, Amanda Waller is many things. She is conniving. She is manipulative. She is amoral, but she has also got a diehard loyalty to the state. One thing she is not is stupid. Yeah. She would never have been caught in a situation where she needed a suicide squad to, to rescue her. And she... Never. And uh, like, so her impetus for creating the Suicide Squad was: What happens and now that Superman's gone? What happens if someone attacks the White House? Call Wonder Woman? No. Call the Flash? No. Call Aquaman? No. Call Shazam? He hasn't been created yet. No, no. We need to call supervillains. Why? Because. Uh, do I need to explain this even anymore? Here's the thing, though. In the comics, I'm sure I don't need to explain this to anyone, but just for the few stragglers, if the case there are any, the Suicide Squad, basically, in the comics, are the Black Ops wet working organization designed to secure uh, or indeed take out American interests or people who are acting against American interests. Simple. Shouldn't need to get there. They are not a brand new superhero team. They're illegal off the books Death Squad. This movie understands that the previous movie didn't. Because why otherwise would you have your gang of, you know, collared and hopefully obedient super criminals be escorted around by a bunch of soldiers? (laughs) Ah, man. And and, and the fact that she brought... If you think about the premise of that movie for like half a second, it also doesn't make any sense that the biggest enemy is Enchantress and she brought Enchantress into the team. Why would you bring her? (laughs) Okay, so who else have you got on your team? You got Boomerang Guy, you got a person with a manager, you got an expert sniper, what else? Oh, we've got this magic lady that can't be controlled. Where are you keeping her? In a hotel. And what's what's her big fail safe? Oh, she's in love with this guy that she just met. And he's in love with her. Oh, really? And that's always going to be the same? Well, not really, because like there's the other half of her that isn't in love with him, and it's just like this crazy, world-conquering, magical being that is virtually unstoppable. Huh. Well, let's hope we don't have to sick our own team that we want her to be a part of on her. That'll make us look really stupid. <sighs> Though, in fairness, that does fit into a lot of American foreign policy. Like, creating bad situations <laughs> and then... Pretending like they're the ones that need to fix it. Anyway, this movie scales all that down, understands exactly what they've been used for, and that's, honestly, this movie comes across as sort of like just an average day for the Suicide Squad, almost. Yeah, uh, yeah the threat they're, they're looking at is big, but you get to feel like this is just one story out of many, which is perfect. Yeah, and and I think they they doubled down on the silliness, which is something that we kind of needed because the first one, even Killer Croc, who yeah, in the comics he's a scary big guy. He just looked weird, and he didn't have anything about it. And he then, didn't like, do color... anything. I don't remember anything about him. He just hung out in the back, had a had his hoodie on, and we just said like, "It's going to get us an Oscar for best makeup. It's going to get us an Oscar for best makeup. Just do nothing and get the Oscar." <laughs> And didn't it didn't it have the best uh, the best makeup Oscar? I'm pretty sure. It I think so because I mean, in fairness, that looked pretty damn good. But the character didn't do anything, so no one cared. Yeah, and then you look at the counterpart in this movie, King Shark, and he's incredible. Every scene he's Friend. in, he steals. Oh my god, the bird when they're doing the mic check, and he's like, bird. "What do you see, bird?" Perfect. And Stay off comms. The, the, the whole movie, I was wondering, who voices that? Who does that? That name feels familiar. It's only Sylvester Stallone. They got him back from Guardians of the Galaxy. I guess he and James Gunn hit it off. And he's just doing monosyllabic himbo quotes from a shark. Rocky's a shark. It was incredible. I, I was so excited. And the fact that... And, oh, my God, King Shark is the only character in this movie other than Harley Quinn with plot armor. 
because he just could not be killed. Every scene I thought people he was tried though be in Venice, and there were times like, "Oh, is he actually going to get out of this?" And it kept me guessing. And the reason why it kept you guessing is the intro. So we need to probably start talking about this. So it starts with Michael Rooker. Um, in fact, you know, before we even talk about the plot, let's just talk about the characters. Let's talk about the Suicide Squad because there's a ton of people in this movie. So we've got Margot Ret- Robbie returning as Harley Quinn. We have got Idris Elba as Bloodsport, a semi-replacement for Deadshot. They were hoping to get him back in. There were scheduling conflicts. It couldn't happen. That's a shame. So they're going to have Idris Elba recast as Deadshot. That didn't work out. So they said, you know what, fucker, we'll just call him Bloodsport just in case we ever manage to get Will Smith back, which I'm fine with. I'm absolutely fine with because he seems like a different character. Yeah, John and Cena. I enjoyed his weapons, which I should oh, give God, a yeah. small... <laughs> the, the merchandise, you can only imagine. Uh, John Cena as the delightfully weird Peacemaker. He's going to be having his own TV show. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, Joel Kinnaman returns as Rick Flag, except now I actually give a fuck because it's the first movie I've ever seen Joel Kinnaman give a good performance in. I, he was funny. He was actually <laughs> funny. He was having a good time. Joel Kinnaman always, every movie he's in, it's it's like he just won their way. An endoscopy right before he's so stilted and serious and he's like this the entire time and in this it's one ba- he's like, it's relaxed. bad direction i swear i i like i watched that robocop reboot and i thought this guy should be better he's not i don't get it it he, uh but he he rick he's back as rick flag and he's much more interesting now we'll get into that later sylvester stallone as we said is king shark also known as nanawe and um, we're only going to call him king shark let's be honest yeah. uh Viola Davis returns as Amanda Waller. She's infinitely better in this movie, even though she was pretty already damn good. But that's Viola Davis. Like, she's great in everything. Jai Courtney returns as Digger Harkness, a.k.a. Captain Boomerang. Awesome. Peter Capaldi is also in the movie as Gaius Greaves, a.k.a. The Thinker. But he's not officially part of the Suicide Squad. We'll get to that. And not the Uh, same thinker from The Flash, if anyone's wondering. That was a different thinker. There's two thinkers in DC? Jesus. I just, <laughs> I just like seeing Peter Capaldi in other things now. Um, we've got oh, also a- another character from the, the both DC and Marvel. He was in The Dark Knight and both Ant Man and Ant Man and the Wasp. Uh, David Dasmalshian as Abner Krill, aka Polka Dot Man. My favorite of this movie. He was the the star for me. <laughs> was the star for me? Uh, he was very close. The star for me was Daniela Melchior probably getting that name wrong, as Cleo Caso, H- a.k.a. Rat Catcher 2. I love her. I want a movie just with her. She's amazing. We'll get into that. Uh, da, 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 who else we got? Uh, Taka Watiti has a small cameo appearance as Rat Catcher 1, uh, Cleo's father. That was really cool. Um, she's also got a pet rat named Sebastian, voiced by D. Bradley Baker. I, I just want to say, uh, this is a small caveat, but if you watch the credits, they have the name of the actual rat up, and his name yeah. is Crisp Rat. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I'm so glad that we're finally giving rat actors the respect they deserve. Exactly. Um, we've also got, as you said, Michael Rooker as Savant. We've got Pete Davidson as Blackguard, or if you live in the UK, Blackguard. Seriously, that, 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 that's a <laughs> fun fact about the word blackguard. That's an old timey uh, medieval uh, insult, which people in the House of Commons, the UK Parliament, are still no longer allowed to call each other when Parliament is in session. When they're having like Prime Minister's questions and they're having the back and forth, there are certain words like you're not allowed to swear. You're not allowed to call someone blackguard. Otherwise, the Speaker of the House will get very angry with you. Oh my that's, God. That's a whole thing. Uh, Blackguards there. Uh, we've also got Nathan Fillion as TDK, aka the Detachable Kid, which I believe is a reference to my favorite DC character of all time. I'll fall off, boy. I thought of that exact same thing. <laughs> I was in that episode and I thought of the exact same thing. I was like, "Oh my god, I'm fall off, my boy! boy. My boy's come home." <laughs> oh. oh god. Uh, also, Sean Gunn, the brother of James Gunn, who frequently appears, is in a dual role as both Calendar Man, briefly shown in 
at one point in a, in a prison scene. And also Weasel. He's a weasel man. I wanted to see more of him. We'll get to that. <laughs> oh, God. Flula Borg is Javelin, a former Olympic athlete who has a javelin as a weapon. Myling Ning, her, who's a Mongal, uh, an alien relative of Mongol, a Superman villain, who, fun fact, that actor was also as a stunt performer in Wonder Woman. So she's been in a DC movie before. Uh, who else we got? Uh, Alice Braga as Solsoria. She's in the movie. Uh, a couple of act- other actors who are playing um, various uh, people within the Corto Maltese government slash militia, because that's where this movie is set. Uh, Storm Reed, you may remember from the Wrinkle in Time movie, mm-hmm. as Bloodsport's daughter, Tyler. Uh, who else? Who else? Who else? Who else? Um, oh, fun little cameo from Joss John Ostrander, who's the creator of the 1980 Suicide Squad. He's Dr. Fitzgibbon, who I believe is the guy who implants, uh, like the bombs in their necks. Nice. That's a fun cameo. That's nice. I think we covered all the major players. Have I missed anyone out? There's a couple of like, um, tech people working on in Argus for Amanda Waller. They get a couple of prominent roles. I think that's everyone. Yeah, I think that's I think that's all. There's a couple of I don't know if there's a uh, actual cameos from like uh, other famous actors, but I know that there's a couple of like lesser known DC villains that you can kind of see, and uh, you see Kaleidoscope at one point and things like that. But it's like smaller DC things. Okay, and also side note, and I thought like, is that her? But for some reason, and I don't know why, Pom Clementif gets a cameo appearance as a dancer in a nightclub. She's just, <laughs> she's just there, and I thought, like, holy shit, that's Mantis. What? Why is Mantis in this movie? Oh, we're, oh, we're not going to just not going to reference that. Does she have any lines? No. Oh, we're just going to move on. No? Okay, then. Guess she was just like was in the neighborhood. She saw James, like, hi, James. You're doing a movie. And he's like, yeah. Do you want to be in it? Sure. That's the only explanation I can think of. Um, <laughs> what, I mean, whatever keeps her out of the fucking uh, Melissa McCarthy movies is fine with me. Anyway, oh. so those are all the people on the menu for the evening. And then we start off with Michael Rooker's Savant. And um, he's tossing a ball around this small cell he's in. And we see a little bird fly down. I'm thinking, like, he's going to kill the bird. He kills the bird. And I'm worried. I'm slightly worried. Like, is this movie going to be predictable? I'm, I'm getting flashbacks to 2016. Oh, God. Oh, God. And But then he's recruited into the Suicide Squad. We're given the rundown, like the Cliff Notes version, blah, 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 blah. Um, you do the mission. Don't die. Don't display orders. Otherwise, we'll blow your head off. If you succeed, you get 10 years off your sentence. Boom. They explained the whole thing in less than three minutes what it took the first act of the first movie to, to accomplish. Like, that's speedy. Yeah. And and I, I like that they didn't kind of hammer it in because, you know, you watch that whole scene in the first one of Will Smith showing that he can shoot and that whole thing. And, like, he's But we already got a, a sequence reason. with that. Like, we know he can shoot. Yeah. It's... For God's sake, movie! Choke on a slice of shut up cake, you unfathomable swamp crab! It's just God damn it! Get a move on, and then you actually get into the meat and potatoes of the movie, and you realise no, go back to Will Smith shooting people. That was yeah, I'd rather see that. But, but now this is literally the first couple of minutes of the movie. We establish uh, the people who are going to be, you know, going into and invading this place, Corta Maltese. Basically, this is a South American uh, island nation. Uh, was, was that Rico Rodriguez swinging by? No, maybe not. Uh, and basically, there, there was a coup. Previous um, family that were running the place, all dead, including the kids. Yeah, the first 10 minutes of the movie, we start off with child murder. We see their little bodies being hung. Yeah. It's like, oh, so they're not playing around here. And it's a brand new violent dictatorship getting started that are no longer aligned with American interests. Ooh. And immediately I'm thinking like, oh, coming in hot with the American geopolitical <laughs> criticism. I'm liking this. <laughs> oh, God. And there's then they, they fly over. We're introduced to... Okay, so it's 
Um, it's Rick Flag, Harley Quinn, Weasel, Boomerang, Blackguard, Javelin, Savant, and Mongal. And Mongal. And I think that's it. TDK, TDK, TDK. TDK, of course. Who could forget? How could I forget my boy? Uh, TDK, <laughs> nine members of the Suicide Squad flying in, and they have a drop over the sea to uh, to get to the beach where they need to get started. <laughs> However, nobody bothered to check to see if Weasel, who seems barely sentient, could swim. He immediately starts to drown. Uh, that scene of Amanda Waller asking her team if no one checked if he could swim and they just go dead quiet. Hilarious. No the one picks eye contact with her. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's just... And, and Michael Rooker drags Weasel's waterlogged body to the shore and says, Weasel's dead. I repeat, Weasel is dead. <laughs> And it's just like, oh, we're barely five minutes into the movie and already Weasel, who's been front and center on a lot of the marketing material, is dead. And I thought to myself, hmm, are they uh, going to throw some curveballs at us? Are we not going to know who's going to live and who's going to die? Then Pete Davidson does what he does on most of his SNL skits and proceeds to fuck things up. He approaches the Corto Maltese army, says, Hey guys, I called you. I'm here to betray my team. Help me dig this bomb out of my neck and we'll be all good, right? Get shot in the face. Immediately. Whole face is gone, by the way. I should mention how gruesome that shot is. <laughs> yeah, this movie does not hold back. It's rated 15 over here in the UK. I think they could have stretched to an 18. They could have gone full Deadpool. But you know what? It comes pretty goddamn close. I think the only reason why it stayed a 15 over here, uh, I don't know what the appropriate uh, counterpart over in the US is. PG-13? Uh, no. Yeah. no. I think so. Mm. <laughs> I don't know what it is. It should be rated R here. Uh, but... Uh, I think the only reason why it isn't is because you don't see any female nipples. That's the only reason I can think <laughs> and of. And they barely cursed, too. That was another thing. They didn't curse that much. And that was a big thing here, that they don't say curse. Well, you can show a man get eaten by a shark and little kids hanging, but you can't say fuck. <laughs> oh, God. I mean, over here, you can like say one fuck, and that's it. And that's how the you, X-Men movies got away for so long. <laughs> yeah, you got one fuck per movie. And it usually yeah, went you, to Wolverine. <laughs> yeah, so use it wisely. Yeah, I, I see you, Hugh Jackman. Don't immediately leap to it. Let it simmer. Um, so yeah, Weasel's dead. Blackguard's dead. Javelin gets shot a bunch, but then it's time for TDK to show off his powers, and he detaches his arms, and they float slowly across the battlefield and start feebly slapping against the the the, the opposite soldiers' faces. And that's all he can do. And I'm thinking, yes, this is the fall off boy. I armful off boy. I wanted to see <laughs> completely useless played by an actor that I love. Is he going to die? His arms get shot. He starts gurgling up blood. Oh Jesus! Mongal jumps over to a helicopter, brings it down. It smashes on her, setting her on fire. And I'm thinking, oh my god, this couldn't possibly get any worse. Then they kill off Captain Boomerang. Which immediately shocked me. Yeah, I couldn't oh, believe they actually it. going there? Because I avoided a lot of the marketing material for this movie, like the trainers and stuff, because I didn't want to know who was going to live and who was going to die. And thank God this movie actually supported, rewarded people who did that, because you would be entirely shocked by the fact that Jai Courtney gets in Paled in multiple directions by a bunch of different shrapnel and then killed in front of Harley Quinn. And she's like, oh no. And oh no, then Flew Le Borg dies. And he hands his javelin over to Harley Quinn because they had a bit of a moment because she thought his accent was sexy. And in fairness, she was not wrong. And <laughs> and the answer, like, this javelin needs to be held by. But by, by, by who? By, by, by what? Snap out of it. Who am I supposed to? And I'm thinking, like, I missed you, Harley. I missed you. <laughs> she's so she's so good. She's really growing into this Harley role. Every movie she plays Harley in is is better than the last as far as like yeah. her playing uh, Harley. I'm waiting for a true solo movie. Like Birds of Prey doesn't technically count. It comes close, but still. Yeah. Um 
And I also like how in the beginning, she, her outfit is probably the best Harley Quinn outfit we've had so far. Like, I liked her outfits and Birds of Prey, but uh, this really harkens back to the original Harley Quinn outfit. It's got like the leather jacket and stuff and like the two-tone black and red stuff. Infinitely better than the shitty, 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 shitty costume she had in the original Suicide Squad. Oh, she's wearing short shorts. No, no. Suicide Squad just made it worse to the original one. Because you, sh- you see her in her actual Harley Quinn, like, OG comics outfit. In a I flashback. Mean, OG, in a flat, oh, not even comics, like the OG, like, animated series outfit for, like, three seconds. And you're like, is this what we're going to get? It's like, no, she's going to wear fishnets and have Joker tattoos. And you're like, come on. They actually removed one of her tattoos. Like, she had a face tattoo that says rotten. But they both her and James Gunn said, do we like this? No, we don't like this. Let's remove it. And and then her so, property of Joker is now property of nobody, which I really enjoy. Absolutely fucking love that. And it really does feel like this character has continued on uh, from Birds of Prey. It's so cool to see her. Uh, and she ends up uh, getting captured by Corto Maltese army. And uh, Rick Flagg also managed to escape into the jungle. The only one left is Savant. And he sees the destruction, the carnage. And he's like, fuck this shit, I'm out. Runs away off into the sea, screaming his head off. And Amanda Waller's just like, I'ma blow your head off. Ah, ah, I'ma blow your head off. Ah, ah. Blowing your head off. Boom. Splur. Scanners. And it's like, holy shit, Michael Rooker got killed off in the first act of a James Gunn movie. What is this? And <laughs> then we open with the titles and we get like just a fun happy bop song over all of these dead bodies including Savant's when a little bird flies down and pecks at his neck stump and i'm thinking yes justice for the birds <laughs> uh, so I and mean, you're left with like holy crap what so the entire suicide squad is dead what are we do now we're we gonna like flash forward to a new mission no turns out there's a second suicide squad team led by Bloodsport, featuring all those other characters we mentioned earlier that didn't die in this one beach and their team b and it turns out that maybe blackguard's betrayal was blackguard i'm, def- <laughs> I'm defaulting <laughs> oh you blackguard Maybe his betrayal was anticipated by Waller because, again, Waller's not stupid. He knows everything. She's Mm. got plans on everything, which comes in handy later. She's got plans within machinations, within designs, within riddles. She's she's got every angle covered. And basically, this new, this squad B, and I really like they're doing it, and I like that it's featuring mostly new characters. Uh, I would have liked if Boomerang had survived, just because I enjoy that character. But you know what? His death was effective in the movie, so he's he's still coming back because he's still he he has a credit in the next Flash movie. Oh, yeah. I presu- I presumably, he'll be in a flashback then. Okay. Yeah. So he's they, they like straight up said that he's going to interact with the Flash again. So cool. So, you know, I will say going back just a little bit, his before he dies, that new boomerang he has is incredible. It's it's like this glow in the dark, super bright boomerang. And it's just like decapitating, cutting heads in half. Oh, yeah. You see guys get like underworlded, just like (laughs) slice right in the middle like a melon. I I was sensitive soul, but I enjoy it when it's in a movie like this. And... So Team B's job is to go to this place called Jotunheim. It's a big tower in the middle of Corte Maltese, which was a Nazi-era laboratory where they've got a bunch of creepy experiments going on led by this guy called the Thinker. Their job is to infiltrate it, blow it up, destroy it, and get the hell out of Dodge. And we're int- we get a flashback introducing all these characters. We take a bit more of our time with them. We see the char- some of the characters that have previously died. Just... And so that's really cool. And so it's, they were just so, so weird. Because that's the thing with the original Suicide Squad movie. The characters were um, potentially interesting, but none of them were that weird, except for the crocodile man who did nothing. Yeah, and I and I really, really enjoyed John Cena. Oh my God. I, yeah. I think that the... the I wanted the him and James of- Gunn to work together. I wanted him to be Drax the Destroyer originally. Oh, wow, I could see that. Yeah, I, I, I like Dave Bautista in it. I just thought that John Cena was you know, a bit taller, a bit more. I just, I just thought maybe yeah. he could 
do it a bit better? I don't know. Probably not in retrospect, but I'm glad he's in it now. And yeah, because his whole thing is like, um, in the comics, it's so interesting in the comics, he was originally a diplomat who also, by night, was a vigilante. It was so weird. But now he's just like, I'll kill millions of people for peace. <laughs> this one is That's really fun. dumb. But, but he's so cool. But that's so dumb. <laughs> and that's the whole thing. This guy is like, if if Captain America was a, so- a sociopath, this is mm. who he plays. That 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 was the acting notes uh, James Gunn gave him. Like, no, you're a dude, bro, Captain America. Okay, and James Gunn, uh, James John Cena, sorry, ran with that. He really did run with that. And we're also introduced to Polka Dot Man, who's so delightfully weird. You, for the longest time in the movie, you don't know what his deal is, and then it's revealed what his deal is, and it's like, oh shit, this guy is no longer funny. Yeah, it, he's he's a Star Labs experiment that his mother conducted, and. He got an alien virus, and now he has to. What did Harley? Oh, that was uh, Bloodsport. Says he has to ejaculate polka dots, and he has to get po- these polka dot virus things out of his body at least twice a day. Otherwise, he gets like these weird, glowing, multicolor disco pustules on his body, and eventually it will kill him. And he can shoot them out of his hands thanks to these uh, technological god- gauntlets he's got that um, dissolve people. With like big holes in them. Yeah, this just just destroys like, everything. This is like only James Gunn. Actually, I say that Taika Waititi also, but James Gunn just takes the weird and he makes it. He just injects it with pathos. You really care about this guy because you see the trauma he's gone through and how much he hates his mum when it's revealed that he sees everyone as this middle-aged woman. Literally everybody. It's such a this weird like PTSD is done in a really weirdly delightful way. And yeah, and this, like literally everyone, and it's so fucking weird. We never see a flashback with him and his mum. We never get that. He just describes it, but we instantly know what this guy deal is when we see when you see like everyone's in their costume, but it's his mum. The King Shark Mom is especially good. It's Actually kind of horrifying. Um, and we've got King Shark, who seems barely there. I was would have been tempted to substitute King Shark for Weasel. But at the same time, like, he, he, he's so sweet when he's not trying to eat people. Yeah, like, he immediately the, tries to eat Ratchcatcher too. And... She's got this whole narcolepsy thing going on. It's like, oh, she's young. She sleeps all the time. But it literally tries to the, eat her. Eat her. And she's like, she's like, no, King Shark, we don't do that, do we? He's like, sorry. <laughs> and it's, you can't stay mad at him. And it, I think the movie would have been less if he had been the one to die instead of Weasel. Because honestly, Weasel's just like this weird, like, <laughs> sort of character. And honestly, there's very little momentum you could have with that as fun as that is it's best when they keep that minimal you know and so they made the right decision like it, you, you've got this idea in your head about where you want this movie to go but deep down you know that the way it's going is the right way and the most effective way this is the brilliance of james gunn uh do we miss any so we've got peacemaker king sharp polka dot man rat catcher 2 uh and so uh, she's been described as the breakout star and it's not hard to see why but just because she's like the one bright spot of pure goodness in this movie yeah it's it's unclear even why she got really arrested like i don't think we really go in depth about that we just know that she has a, her dad had a thing for training rats uh she has a thing for training rats uh her rat is the best. He's the reason why she survived the King Shark uh, near attack because he woke up. Uh, he woke up Bloodsport and said, "Yo, she's about to get eaten. Help me out here." <laughs> and Bloodsport, BT Dubs, has an innate phobia of rats. Hates them. It's and as it's a person, so, who... it's so many, so many comedic potentials. And I think the reason why so many people like this character is because, and I mean this in the nicest way possible. She's Squirrel Girl. 
She is. She's literally Squirrel Girl. Uh, we should mention she doesn't use telepathy or anything. There's a weapon. She has a weapon that controls. Yeah, that. she has like um, the old pace PlayStation Move controller sort of thing. You know, like little, little mini disco balls that spin around. They get like they're like fun fairs and stuff. She's got that, and that controls rats somehow. Except for possibly Sebastian. I guess he's just truly domesticated. Yeah, he's a good rat. He's the best rat. Which I should mention. I grew up in a South American country near the jungle, and there, the, the thing is 80% rats. So oh, God, yeah. <laughs> she's in her element here. <laughs> this is, but I mean, even if it was an urban place, there's rats everywhere. Um, I live in Edinburgh. I can only imagine how many rats there are out there. But yeah, it's, <laughs> so, and this is the thing. Each of these characters feels unique, brings something new to the table. They have a little j- bit of a joke at first because they like, Blood sport, raised from birth to be the ultimate mercenary, an expert in hand-to-hand combat and all forms of weaponry. Peacemaker, raised from birth to be the ultimate mercenary. And combat. And this is like, what the fuck? No, no, he does the exact same thing I do. But and I Peacemaker's do it like, better. <laughs> but I do it better. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> what if I shoot you? Then I'll shoot through your bullet with a smaller bullet. <laughs> <laughs> God, yes. <laughs> All of these actors have such great chemistry and great lines, and I think it's because they have a good writer and director to support them. People say that the original Suicide Squad cast wasn't very good. I don't entirely agree with that. I think it was a very good cast. I just don't think they were given the right material or support. Yeah. I'm just giving stupid things to do, and they just sort of wandered around for a bit. And and, I, and the silliness here is always rewarded by a, like the cast... Being because Bloodsport is the one like truly serious character. Bloodsport is the character that doesn't really get he's the any dad jokes. of the group. Yeah, he doesn't really get any jokes. He's the stoic character, but his reaction to the silliness is always really, really good. Because even though he's not funny per se, he's competitive, and so he fights with Peacemaker the whole time. He's like, "I'm better than Peacemaker. I'm going to kill more people." And then that they're that told scene... to infiltrate this camp of people where supposedly Rick Flag is being held, and the whole thing is just like one big long tracking shot with these two characters being like Legolas and Gimli, just trying to warn up each other, killing each other, and yet somehow the whole camp isn't alerted. I don't know how. I mean, there's a fair amount of noise made. And yeah, King Shark immediately eats a guy very loudly, and then it becomes like style point kills, like them <laughs> shooting a guy and shooting a toaster, and the toaster falls into the tub, and there's just a ridiculous amounts of like things. And I'm just thinking, like, this is fun. Remember fun? I, it, it's, it's so much fun. And um, I think the only person who doesn't kill anyone is actually rat catcher. She just uses her rats to disable people. And it's, it's it's a great little fun. And then he finally get to Rick Flag, and he's like hanging out and having fun with Alice Bragger, who plays Solsoria. And just like, oh no, they weren't holding me here. Like I'm, I'm I'm the guest. These are rebel freedom fighters who are fighting against the people that we're fighting against. Did you kill anyone on your way in here? Oh, we killed everyone. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's just a shot of her oh, looking at an indescribable anguish. It's the shot of her just looking at the camp like, what the hell? <laughs> that guy was two days away from retirement. Wait, you killed the washing lady? The wa- she wasn't even a combat person. She just like did odd jobs around the camp. She doesn't even know how to hold a gun. Why? <laughs> John Cena's lines and showing how deranged he is while this is happening is also really important. And him saying, mm. I will kill well, women and children for freedom because <laughs> freedom is what matters. If there was a whole beach of dicks, I would eat them all for freedom and America. And if you like, ask a character like that to describe freedom, like define it, he'd have no clue what to say. It's, he's, he's such like the embodiment of like, this American jingoistic sort of do bro machismo chest thumping sort of thing. And it's, it's, he's just such a parody of himself that it works so well. I know they never explain why he wears that stupid weird helmet. It's a beacon of freedom. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I, I I enjoy him a lot, and and then it's also good to mention that uh he he respects Rick Flag. That's another thing. He thinks Rick yeah. Flag is a hero. He doesn't appreciate Bloodsport, but he thinks Rick Flag is just a hero. 
Yeah, and then the great thing about Rick Flag, the end. This movie also understands what Rick Flag is. He is the leader. He's sort of the everyman, but he's also got the enough iron will to corral these disparate groups of nut jobs and mercenaries. That's like, his job. He's not a criminal, but they respect him because he's crazy enough to do this missions willingly. And he rocks a little yellow t-shirt. <laughs> yes, he does. Oh, God. Meanwhile, Harley Quinn has been shoved down the bottom of a pit, all tied up. But then she's brought to the capital of Mal- Corte Maltese, given like a little bit of a makeover, and presented to the uh, new leader of Corte Maltese, uh, pl- uh, Silvio Luna, I believe his name is, played by Juan Diego Boto. And he's just like, you, Harley Quinn, are like, an inspiration to my people. You're the embodiment of anti-American sentiment for some reason. And she's like, you're hot! Kiss, kiss for love. We just have an extended romance sequence where they whine and dine each other and eventually fuck. And it's just like, okay. And he gives us some exposition about Jotunheim. It's like, oh, a bunch of people in the previous administration like took all the political distance and their families and their families' children and they threw them in there and they never came out. And I'm going to do the same. She kills him. Immediately shoots him. <laughs> and she rationalizes it by saying, like, I'm sorry, I really liked you. I thought you were great and you got a fantastic penis, by the way. But I've been doing like a lot of self-care recently, looking out for red flags in my boyfriends and talk like that is a big old red flag. So I shot you because I'm Harley Quinn and that's what I do. Which, which really goes to say how bad the guards of that Presidente are because... While they were fucking, they destroyed the whole apartment. She fired a gun and it took them five minutes to get in there. So honestly, they had it out for him. It's, yeah, and um, it's, she, she had like an old antique pistol and she shot him and like, wait, this thing's loaded? <laughs> and she then gets uh, taken away to be, you know, tortured and interrogated. Uh, so we leave her for a little bit. Uh, they're the rest of the Suicide Squad, their goal is to capture the thinker as he goes to a nightclub and try and get him to infiltrate uh, Jonheim. So they dress all up in civvies and they go to a nightclub and have a little bit of a dance. Which is a really enjoyable part of the movie. I think that Dave, Man, I think Polka Dot Man actually going out there and them encouraging him to have a good time, I think was weirdly sweet. Because you have these, like, you have Rick Flagg and Bloodsport and John Cena, these incredibly, like, big, hot dudes having a good time at a bar. And you can see that. And they're kind of pushing, like, their scrawny, nerdy friend to also have a good time. <laughs> and it's, like, so weirdly wholesome. You kind of cheer for that. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, was, um, I just go back to thinking, hey, remember the bar scene from the previous movie? Remember how everyone said that was really good, but then stopped to think about it and realized, actually, no, this is kind of lame? Yeah. I present you an alternative. Exactly. Uh, okay, we're, we're, we're skipping out, uh, quite a lot. I mean, because a lot of this, I guess the great thing about this movie is a lot of it is them talking with each other, exploring each other's backstories, getting to know each other, forming rapports. And that's great because in the previous movie, they didn't really do that except for that one bar scene where they realized, oh shit, our characters basically don't like each other. We need to quickly like rush some exposition and get them to like each other right now. But this, in this movie, it's spaced out constantly for various lulls in action. And it works really well. Uh, you see, like this, this is lovely bit with we have a flashback of Ratcatcher hanging out with Taika Waititi in Portugal, just looking over the whole city with their rats. And it's just like, oh, and I'm I saw Taika Waititi's name in the credits. I thought, wait, Taika Waititi's in this? What's he going to do? And is this just like this small cameo appearance as this crazy wild-haired person? Although I will say Taika Waititi, he's not actually Portuguese. So No. Yeah, he's... I'm not... He's uh, New Zealand? He's from New Zealand, I believe. Yeah, he's from New Zealand. And uh, (laughs) although I will say the actress playing Ratcatcher... Uh, two, uh, she is from Portugal. But I don't think I think this is her first time being in an English language movie. She's done a few oh. other movies in Portugal, but it's it's great that she's going. Out. I hope I see her in more things because she's really really good. She, she really she really stands out, and her her chemistry with Idris Elba is really good. Because Idris, 
you they know, got like a, a, a daughter father sort of thing going on, like a, it, that that sort of relationship. Because it should be mentioned, he's only doing this for his daughter, and even though he admits he doesn't oh, want to be a father, we, we, I completely and... forgot to talk about that. Okay, so basically, his daughter got caught stealing like a watch. What does the watch do? You watch TV on it. Why would you want to watch the TV on it? And Warner basically says, "Bloodsport, I want you to be in Suicide Squad. I'm not going to do it." Okay, well, your daughter's going to go to jail, and you know, bad things happen in jail. Your daughter's going to get killed. And she doesn't say that. She merely implies it. He immediately takes a knife to her throat. She doesn't flinch an inch. And even tells everybody to stand down, which Viola Davis. Oh. <laughs> she, she, just look, she fixes it with an iron hugger, and you know that not even Idris Elba can hold up to that. He has got to back down from that. And it's just like, okay, fine. I'm going to do that. And so, yeah, that, there's that rapport. And. All of them are such unique sort of reports, like he said earlier, with them trying to push Polka Dot Man into having a good time, and he's out there dancing with, with his people mom. who, to him, <laughs> looks like his mum. Such a good scene of him just dancing with 50, like just 20, 50-year-old ladies around them, and they're all his mom. <laughs> it's so weird, but it's so good. The CGI isn't fantastic, I will say, but... But I've seen worse, in fairness. And that's the, probably the worst example of CGI in this movie. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, King Shark does not get to go out and party because no amount of disguise can, just, can hide the fact that, you know, he's a shark. He does suggest a fake mustache, which I would have <laughs> loved to see. <laughs> oh, God. It's, I, it's just... You just, you just, you can't help but love him. He's a fucking shark, and I love him. What's wrong with me? I, uh, I enjoyed that they. I don't know. I didn't know how it felt because at first I was thinking it was gonna be like he's a guy who turned into a shark, like the comics. And in this, he's not. He's just a shark guy. He's literally like a Maori shark god who is like a reincarnation of an old shark man. And I was like. You know what? I'm in it. Let's do it. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm in this. Because I... honestly, in this team, he doesn't look out of place. You put him in the Avengers, people are going to ask questions. In Suicide Squad, half the course. Yeah, shark guy. Okay, cool. I'm in. Let's keep going. Uh, but before we can keep on going, we've got some more ads. Check them out. So it's at this point we need to talk about Amanda Waller's team. Uh, she's got a bunch of people like tech people working under her. She's like in, in like just it's so cool she's just in this sort of like little drab um government office room I and mean, it's got a lot of, like a bunch of monitors and stuff in there but it doesn't look that high tech which i love is because otherwise it would just it would just be a bit too silly but no it's just this they look like ordinary people in this relatively ordinary room instigating a basic a coup of a <laughs> south american country and it, it i mean i was i can't think of anything more american than that Honestly, it's it's amazing. And I also like how every time you see them, they're kind of not paying attention. Like, unless it's like a big fight scene, they're just kind of shut off. That like, guy's paying Gallagher. That's really, that whole scene is like, that. Like uh, Waller's playing golf and like a, <laughs> with little cups and somebody else is just like... They gave Iona sleep. Davis a funny line! Fat I fucking know. last! It's... It, it was surprising that they gave her a funny line. I was I was so pleasantly surprised. Yeah, because she's like she's got to practice golf for a golf date with a senator. Um, but as time goes on, the, a lot of the tech people start to realize, oh, our boss might be just a little bit of a sociopath, and they start to have a lot of reservations. And that keeps building and building. And I like that they gave that character development to this disparate group of characters whose names we don't know i mean i don't remember their names at the very least no and it's that attention to detail that is one of the many reasons why i love this movie because i mean like scott eastwood was a character in the suicide squad do you remember anything about him no, not at all. No, me neither I, I i remember that he was in it vaguely he was in like a couple of scenes and I was just distracted by the fact that it looks so similar to Joel Kinnaman, and that's it. M yeah. Move the fuck on. And here, <laughs> but I'm going to remember these characters. I'm going to remember all the, you know, the different quirks, and no, I won't remember their names, but they're minor characters. And it's just like, 
James Gunn is very good at that. He's very good at presenting you with ensemble pieces. That's what he did with Guns of the Galaxy and with Slither, actually. There's a lot of different characters that you remember from that movie. Oh, okay. yeah, I, I really enjoyed uh, Stephen Agee because he plays one of the one of her little minions. You know, he's the mm. guy with the beard. You can't miss him. I don't think he's named in the movie, but he's also I think I, I think found, he is actually, but I don't remember. Sorry. And he's and he's also King Shark. He's the body of King Shark. He plays he's King oh, Shark's like, uh, yeah, he's he's the one that does the mocap for King Shark. Ah, because I knew Jay, uh, Sean Gunn did the mocap for Weasel, yeah. uh, but I, I, I didn't know that for King Shark. That's awesome, and and it's it's good that he gives those sort of actors also other on screen roles as well, because you know those are real actors and they deserve a chance to you know. And if you can double them up, that's great. <laughs> I didn't know that. So that's a, that's a great thing yeah. To know. I think he I think because he was also he did minor roles in Gardens of the Galaxy as well. So he's worked ah. with he's worked with James Gunn before. I, I was about to say, was he Taser Face? <laughs> I, I wish. I think I think he just played a guy in the ship because I okay. You know, James Gunn likes he likes his people, so he brings them back. Yeah, th- that's another great thing. And y- you see, Michael Rooker in his movies is like, oh, James Gunn movie. But he knows how to utilize Michael Rooker for the various kinds of roles he has. And Michael Rooker is a very good actor in Fenix. He can do lots of different things. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was so weird to see in the beginning of the movie just crying and shitting himself and running away from the danger. It's like, you don't expect Michael Rooker to do that. No. But he sold you on it. Uh, but anyway, they find the thinker uh, when he comes into. Uh, the nightclub, they capture him and they manage to escape even though the military is going in there. Oh, by the way, when Harley Quinn killed the previous dictator, um, new guy immediately said, like, now I'm El Presidente! <laughs> ah, classic. <laughs> oh, God. And so they hover him away to try and get him to your time, but they realize, oh, wait, Harley Quinn's been captured. We gotta go get her. Because this is a team that actually cares about each other just enough. I mean, there's an element of practicality to it, but it's just like, you know what? Fuck it. Let's never leave a man behind. And it's also important to point out that there's a signal jammer going on right now. That means that Waller and co can't actually communicate with them. They can keep vague tabs on them, but there's very little they can do. Which I, I like, actually. It means like, okay, now that we haven't got our like military overlords looming over our shoulders, now we can actually, you know, think for ourselves a bit. Ooh. So they go to try and get Harley out. She manages to escape all on her own. We get a fantastic ac- action sequence with Margaret Robbie where she's shooting people left and right in a re- oddly robotic way. I'm not sure entirely like that. But then we see like the blood start to be like flowers in her mind. And I'm thinking like, Yes, <laughs> this is incredible. <laughs> it's that's such really a... dumb. But, but he's so cool. But that's so dumb. It's Harley Quinn. It works. And she's they're about to just like sneak into the bone together, and she like creeps on over like, "Hey guys, what you doing?" Oh, oh! Don't forget, she got the javelin back. The javelin comes oh, yes. back. She, the very important plot point. She gets the javelin back. She still doesn't know what the hell she's supposed to do with it, which is the funniest part. That whole thing, like, who's supposed to use this javelin, even though she's absolutely killing the entire palace with the javelin. <laughs> oh God! It's, and I was so worried that Margaret Robbie would get lost in the shuffle in this movie because like, all these new characters. What are they going to be able to do anything interesting with her? No, they utilize because again. James Gunn knows how to use his characters. Yeah. I, and then she I, sh- I really sport. shouldn't be pointing that out as a good thing because the directors should be able to do that. But when we have so many DC movies where the directors haven't been able to use the characters effectively or appropriately, it's a breath of fresh air. It's especially because I think that the special thing about James Gunn is that it's it's hard to use that many characters well. And that's the mm-hmm. thing is like you can get a good director, but you give them a cast of this size and you say, make all these people somewhat memorable. They struggle. But he showed that with Guardians of the Galaxy, he doesn't really need a lot of time to make somebody memorable. He can like really just make lines stick out. And James Gunn excels at that with big teams. With big, big teams and a lot of characters who only have like a minute of screen time, if even that. He put, he made fucking 
uh, Miley Cyrus, some sort of robot. I, I, I don't... And, and imply that they were going to have their own adventures. And it's just like, yes, sure, I believe you, James Gunn, because you fucking wrote the second Scooby-Doo movie. Wait, what? Really? Apparently, and it's the better of the two live-action Scooby-Doo movies. He really movies. wrote the second Scooby-Doo? Yeah, oh, it's right about Magic Oz now, but James Gunn wrote the script for that. I'm not even joking. Look it up. IMDB it. Do it right now, Francisco. I challenge you. You doubt I, me? I, I, I 100% believe you. I just got to add him to the list of directors that have done weird things because George Miller, the, cre- the the director of Mad Max, also the guy who directed Babe and Happy Feet. So like, yeah, that's weird. <laughs> how do you juggle One that? of these things is not like the other. Hey, can you imagine that pitch? You directed three Mad Max movies and you're like, hey, guys, I have a new movie idea. And they're like, ooh, new thriller. What do we got? And he's like, what if a penguin could dance? And you're like, George, are you okay? <laughs> I'm better than okay. I want fucking Robin Williams to be an annoying penguin. It's my Let's dream. Make it <laughs> Let's make it happen. <laughs> and then he did it again. And no one had the guts to stop him. And there's like, okay, so what is it, George? You're going to do another Happy Feet? No, I'm going back to Mad Max. Uh, with the Why? Same people. Because. Okay, is that going to be good? It's going to rock your fucking mind. I can't get... I, it's, yeah, I can't get over how good that movie was. Mad Max is still one of the best movies I've ever seen. The new one, Fury Road. Yeah, uh, it's. <laughs> I, I like though. I like it when directors have range, but they don't get stuck. I mean, some directors are very good at what they do, and they stick in their niche, uh, in their pigeonhole, and that's fine because they're good at what they do. Other directors have fucking range, and I like it when people act so surprised about it. Like when Martin Scorsese did Hugo, a lot of people didn't know what to think because he'd done like so many hardcore gangster movies and stuff like that. Then he does yeah. this delightful send-up of old-style cinema and it's a children's movie and it's Martin Scorsese. No one sees that coming, but it's always a good idea not to underestimate people. Yeah. And it's always a good idea to let them explore new concepts because once in a while you get something that doesn't really work and other times you do. Another great example is actually the, um, what are they called? The Farley Brothers? Um... Farley Brothers? Yeah, they, you know, they did Me, Myself, and Irene oh, yeah. and a lot of movies like that. But then they did something like Shallow Hell, which is actually quite emotional and explores interesting concepts like this guy who's really shallow and then he starts to learn about, to appreciate people on the inside for who they really are uh, for a bunch of weird hypnosis. It's kind of weird. And I'm not saying that movie does that particularly brilliantly, but they tried something new and they got kind of smacked down by the critics. Mm-hmm. And I didn't like that. I thought like, Guys, they tried something new. Regardless if you think that it didn't work, give them props for that at least. Yeah, I think I said that a lot when Ben Stiller directed The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. And, oh, yeah. That's and a, it was like nobody, and nobody was expecting Ben Stiller to actually write a really solid feel-good story. But I came out of that movie like it was uplifting. It was a good movie. And I wasn't expecting something not fun, like not outrageously funny from Ben Stiller, especially with a cast like Kristen Wiig and Ben Stiller. And, and uh, again, it's, it's, it's whenever a comedian actor does a dramatic role, people are like, oh, what? But ha ha man, make me go cry, cry. He usually make me ha ha, <laughs> but cry, cry. I, I don't know what to think. Here's me on the scale of caring. I'm at zero. It's range, people. It's range. People try new things, and that's to be enjoyed and celebrated and not, you know, it shouldn't blow your fucking mind. Because yeah. uh, good actors understand how to do different things. Good comedian actors understand drama because without one, you can't have the other. And dramatic actors can be very funny because, you know, they're good. And we, I I don't know. It's, just, it's this thing in Hollywood where we're just like, let's stick with what we know. And what we know is the same thing we've seen a million times before. And then you have something like The Suicide Squad, which introduces... Oh, my God. I didn't know this was going to happen. I think I, I maybe heard about something, but I thought it was just going to be like a cameo or like an offhand reference. But no, it's a big deal in this movie because they get the thing, they get Harley Quinn, they go to Jotunheim and they discover that the thing that they've been searching for this whole time in Jotunheim is, oh, my God. It's, uh, it's 
It's Starro the Conqueror. That's really dumb. But, but he's so cool. But that's so dumb. It's a massive fucking starfish. It's Project Starfish, which is not a butthole. Um, and, <laughs> and it's just incredible. And it's so It's gruesome. a starfish from outer space! Like, this character's been in the comics for ages. He was, like, the first uh, uh, villain, like, the Justice League ever went up against. And he's universally regarded as being really stupid because he's a massive fucking starfish with an eye in the middle of it. A massive blue starfish. And his powers are really cool because he can, like, take over people's minds with little, like, spores, like a like, mini version of himself, become, like, a starfish drone. But... It's still a fucking starfish! And that's the main bad guy of this movie! I shouldn't be surprised, but I kinda was because it's a massive fucking starfish! Yes! I, I was so surprised at how evil, not, not evil, but like gruesome, because you get there and there's a lab and there's literally just a guy ripped in half with a starfish attached to him. And you see rows of people in cages that have been got starfishes on their faces. And, and I think, like, and I think in the comics that thing is can be reversible. Apparently not in this movie. Once you're starfished, your ass is grass. Yeah, they take a starfish off of one person and there's just nothing there. There's like ripped off. The whole face is gone. This thinker guy has been doing experiments on him for 30 years in that he got discovered floating in space by a bunch of American astronauts and then got shipped to Court of Maltese and has grown so big that the whole of time is built around him. It, it, well, not built around him because it was made in the 1940s. But it, it's so... <laughs> it's so bizarre and yet it fits so well. And do you know what the weird thing is? You think they use this as a big joke. But no... They use this character as an in way to even more political commentary because it turns out that because it was American astronauts discovered it, this whole thing is under American government supervision. They've been experimenting on the people of Corto Maltese with the assistance of the Corto Maltesian government. Harley Quinn has a whole joke about how you pronounce Corto Maltesian people. I won't, not going to repeat it under their supervision but that was with the previous dictatorship and this new dictatorship is anti-american that's why they sent the suicide squad in to uh, get rid of all evidence that the american government was ever involved in this stuff and yeah. they even directly reference all the interfering america has done with south american countries throughout history holy shit they they knock down hard and at this point we're broken down into the two teams we have peacemaker Rick Flag and Ratcatcher 2. And then on the other side, you have Polka Dot Man, King Shark, Harley Quinn, and Bloodsport. Hmm. And and then the revolution is kind of happening in the palace while everybody while the other two teams are kind of doing the thing. And, the, and it's important to say that because Rick Flag, being the true American patriot he is, and knowing that the truth needs to be out, goes, I'm gonna release all this information to the public. And John Cena, Pissmaker, as Rick Flag lovingly calls him, uh, <laughs> says, uh, actually, I'm actually here on a second mission. Amanda Waller told me to release this, and I love you, bro, and you're a hero, but I will kill you. So give me the information. <laughs> yeah, and it's... Oh, God, it's... I just... I, as someone who's vaguely critical of the American government, I was loving this. I'm sure someone who grew up in South America, you loved it. It's, it's, and yeah, it, it just full on addresses like, hey, American government, stop interfering in other people's elections and then whining about it when it happens to you. Yeah, it's the, it's the Eric Andre who shot Hannibal meme. He shoots Hannibal and goes, who disrupted the government? <laughs> <laughs> It's just, that's exactly what it is, and uh, and so Peacemaker and uh, Rick Flag have a big old fight, and Peacemaker kills Rick Flag. Oh no! This is much worse. Yeah, and gruesome, right in front of Ratcatcher, and just you... St so, I mean, it's a brutal fight. He's shoved like shrapnel right into his heart. We get like a Mortal Kombat X-ray of his heart getting impaled. They wanted to make very clear that Rick Flagg was dead and there was no coming back, and they did it. And 
honestly, I it was surprising because Rick Rick Flag was winning in the fight until that point, and then he Peacemaker just got the cleaning shot. And then he's about to kill uh, Ratcatcher. He she manages to get away for a little bit, but he knocks the rat wand out of her hand. That's what I'm choosing to call it, the rat wand. Uh, and <laughs> and then he goes to kill her, and then we get another flashback. Oh god, yeah. Uh, so this is taking place in like two, two sort of timelines. Uh, before all of that, it should be mentioned, Thinker gets torn apart by Starro very brutally. <laughs> Oh, he's not going to regenerate from that. Because he also, apparently, in a really weird line, he is he sexually assaulted Starro, which well, the, was... I think that the, I think that what happened is Starro, like the people under Starro's control, they're not just under his control. It's sort of like Unity from Rick and Morty. They're all Starro. They're all part of this one hive mind. So they're all like, even though they're different like things, it's one individual. So. We can only assume that the thinker sexually assaulted one of his drones, and Starro for that Starro that was it being sexually assaulted in its entirety. So what you're saying is is that the thinker is Rick Sanchez. <laughs> I mean, I'm he sure the his... thinker would like to think that <laughs> Rick Sanchez would thinker. have a couple of things to say about that. <laughs> Oh, I implanted a bunch of things in my brain to make me more smart. Upgrades, people. Upgrades. Rick Sanchez doesn't need to do that. Well, actually, probably does. No, but it's... <laughs> it is, no, here's the thing. Unity consented. Let's not forget that. The people... Uh, the people she was controlling probably didn't consent, but we'll skip over that just for a minute. <laughs> And so, yeah, we flash back to the other team uh, led by Bloodsport. Uh, we get a whole scene with King Shark in a, like this aquarium. And he sees like a bunch of little like 80s cartoon mascots. They look just like the Snorks. I don't know. Just, just like bobbling her along. And he's like having fun with like <laughs> little, little, little tiny creatures. And then they swarm up. The, the glass breaks, swarm over him. It turns out they're deadly mutant fish creatures. And they never explain why these things are in the movie. They never explain why they're on top of the tower. They never explain how they exist. And they have like rows of teeth. They're like belt sanders that can swim. It's like this insane monster. (laughs) And they're just there. They're just there, and it's preceded by a lovely little classical musical piece of King Shark having fun. You hear, you hear Sylvester Stallone giggling like a little child when he's playing with the fish people, and he's just like, "I really don't know what's happening in this movie, and I'm loving every second. And um, it's and that's when, when the the King Shark is he gonna die or is he gonna live? Like fifty minutes of I don't know if King Shark's gonna survive this, and he somehow makes it through being attacked by these monsters, falling off what, like a 20-story building, and then being shot by a 100 Cordo Maltese guards. And then the Cordo Maltese guards make one sad realization. King Shark is bulletproof. (laughs) Uh Uh-oh. See, at that point, I would just like, okay, you know what? I'm going to go for gold. I'd stick my arm inside his mouth and pull the trigger. Like, he'd probably buy my arm off, but I might just be able to get him from the inside. (laughs) But they didn't think that. And a whole bunch of stuff. Basically, Polka Dot Man accidentally sets off the explosives that they've been setting around the building. All this water comes through to them. Uh, Oh, and Milton dies. Who's Milton? (laughs) There's this guy that's been following around, this quarter Maltesian guy, who apparently is named Milton. I'm not up on my South American names. I'm pretty sure no one from South America is called Milton. Just saying. (laughs) Is he a character from Office Space? What's going on here? And... He he dies. He's been like with them, like he's like been driving them around for a little bit ever since they hooked up with Solsoria, and uh, he dies. And there's a whole conversation about that. They end up getting the whole tower collapses. There's this brilliant bit where Bloodsport, like the floor collapses under him, and he's like lands on the floor beneath. He's like, "I'm okay." That floor collapses. Boom! All down all the floors, and he eventually catches up to Peacemaker, who's been leveling a gun. At Ratcatcher, he's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? They shoot each other. P- 
Peacemaker has a big bullet going towards Bloodsport. Bloodsport has a smaller bullet going towards Peacemaker. His smaller bullet goes through Peacemaker's big bullet and shoots him in the fucking neck. Done. How'd you do that? Smaller bullets. Classic. <laughs> so many things are happening in this movie at this point. Dogs and cats living together. Mass hysteria. It's, <laughs> it's brilliant. They go out and they encounter the Corte Maltese in government. They've got the hard drive full of all the dirty American secrets. Then Starro breaks free. And he starts smashing over. Like, he keeps on saying, This city is mine! And I think, like, just the city? I, I thought Star of the Conqueror. Sure, you want the whole planet, but I don't know. Um, and so they, they managed to realize, don't get your, your, your face clamped on by a bunch of, like, chest bursters, whatever they are. Rat, rat catcher manages to evade it with the simplest solution is to put on a damn mask. The mask <laughs> that she's shown sporadically throughout the movie, but that she keeps on taking off for some reason. Like, I just have that on the whole time. Mind you, in the Corte Maltese in heat, would you want to get a mask on? That's I can barely true. manage in Edinburgh with the <laughs> super cloth mask. Um, then, uh, and so they realized, <laughs> like... <laughs> Oh, Them. Waller, now that Jotunheim's been destroyed, Waller says, okay, back in communications, have you got the data drive of all the dirty American secrets? Yes. Cool. Run away. Get to the evac center. But, like, the people, all the people, not our problem. <gasps> and they start to walk away. And this is the brilliant thing about this movie, is that normally you think, oh, they're obviously going to turn back. And they do turn back. They go back to help the people. But this movie has you second guessing that because you've been second guessing everything since the first five minutes. It so when it gives you what you expect, it actually turns out you didn't expect it, which is genius. And, and I think that the, the the part that really sold me is that because they were just killing off everybody, and and all of them start turning around. Bloodsport turns around. Harley turns around. All of them start towards going towards Starro. And the part of the movie that really had me second guessing is because they've killed everybody so far. They didn't care. So when Waller said, I'm going to blow your heads off, I honestly expected Idris Elba to just die right then. I was expecting like that to be the end of the movie with them just dying. And th th I've never seen a movie where I fully believed that they were just going to kill the main cast. But that movie had me thinking, I think they're just going to kill everybody. And the next movie is just going to have a whole new cast. And unlike things like Rogue One or other movies that have done like, oh, we're going to kill all of our people, yeah, that would have had an impact. And just like, I doubt they would have killed Harley Quinn or something like that because she's the big money maker. But because they're all brand new characters and the only other returning character like Rip Flag, Captain Boomerang, they're all dead. So, and they've got, you know, dead shot in the wings. They could kill all of them and just move on. Yeah. And they could have done that. And because they could have done that, we think that they're going to do that. So when they don't do that, it's amazing because Amanda Waller gets knocked the fuck out with a golf club to the head by one of her subordinates. Everyone freaks out and the lady just immediately takes charge and goes, um, let's go save these people. Rally. Let's kill Starro. It's yeah, it's <laughs> And it's, it's a big moment, and they start fighting against Starro, and Bloodsport's just like, Oi, Polka Dot Man! What? Starro, that's your mum! <laughs> Giant fucking middle-aged woman tearing up the city! And he starts, like, dissolving her legs and stuff. And he's like, and here's the thing, his whole backstory was that his mum was trying to turn him into a superhero against his will. And now he's like, last, finally, I'm a superhero! Get smushed immediately smushed so sad i i oh, i like this story indescribable anguish such such a good story i i love the zark because he actually did damage to starro he destroyed that thing he was life. a heavy hitter like he yeah. could he point his fist at you and you go dissolve and he goes take it out and, and this is again we're going back to the thing like you think that all these characters are going to survive now no! Polka Dot Man gets killed! They, I would have been fine if they had all survived, but no, he gets full-on crushed. It's just like, I don't know where I stand with this movie. I feel like I'm in an abusive relationship. <laughs> I, I, it's, I, except it's like, 
I'm not going to say a good abusive relationship. I'm going to stop myself from saying that. But it, it, it's just like, I don't know where I stand with the movie. And I love it. I love it so much. Harley Quinn realizes, oh my God, I know why I have the javelin. She climbs up a building and does a full-on Spartan leap into Starro's eye. Oh, yeah. With the javelin, which is fantastic. And then the rat catcher, she's like, I'm going to summon a bunch of rats. And a blood sport is like, all right. And she holds him and they squat down while swarms of rats swarm over them, climb up Starro and start eating Starro from the inside out. Thanks to the hole that Harley made. And she managed to get out and it looks like they managed to to save the day and Star's just like I just wanted to drift in space and see the stars so and I was sad. like movie are you making me care about the fucking starfish holy shit and then he dies and it's like okay so Star of the Conqueror took over the minds of a whole bunch of people undoubtedly a bad person creature thing but like he didn't ask for this he was yeah. captured in space by a bunch of astronauts he didn't and it's like I feel bad for the fucking starfish. What is this movie? You really do. You really feel bad for him. And it's it's sad and everyone just dies. And all the people that he took over are already dead anyway. It was, it was such a solid 15-minute sequence of just cool, cool shots. And then emotion, emotion, shots and emotion. And then special shout the out. I sickening threat of brutal honesty and I'm wildly uncomfortable. And then special shout out to... To Bloodsport for having the weirdest, coolest gun I've ever seen. He keeps like adding a bunch of it, like it's a, like a bunch of Meccano or something. Like it's Nerf, <laughs> Nerf yeah. <laughs> like he has the Nerf for nothing gun where he touches his suit and something comes out of his suit and he touches the gun and then it becomes part of the gun. And then Wax next thing on. you know, he has like a fidget spinner at the end of it and he actually is doing damage to, Sp- <laughs> to Starro. And I was like, okay, that's the neatest thing I've ever seen. Oh god! Just constantly, and there's a big thing at the end where he's just like constantly, and he suddenly thinks that the gun is like twice the size of him, and I'm just sitting here like, upgrades, people, upgrades. I'm really using a lot of sound effects in this one, but they're appropriate. And then at the final bit, he's just like, oh, I'm out. <laughs> he's just he's Good run out of rats. gun bits. Good thing we have rats. <laughs> and yeah, and so. They, it turns out Sorcerer has taken control of the government. She killed all the, like there was, they killed the other guy, like Harley Quinn killed him or something. No, they got infected by Starro. And then another guy was like, okay, now I'm El Presidente. Sorcerer turns up. Not anymore, you're not. And uh, I'm so glad uh, Alice Braga was in a good superhero movie after New Mutants. Oh, good for her. And, and so we see on the TV, like, she's going to, she taking control of the government and she's saying, we're going to have democratic elections. Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, I, good, good luck. But at least, you know, Bloodsport uh, uploaded the files into a private server. And- yeah, he could have released it to the public, but he's just like, look, Walla, I'm going to put this on a private server, so you've got to, you know, let my daughter go, fix a bunch of all the stuff that you did, or we'll release it. And she's like, fine, I've been outplayed. But she doesn't feel like she's been stupidly outplayed, you know? And and it's just, and they love us feeling like, wait, did we save the day? Kind of. Like, we saved the quarter Maltese, but a bunch of people died, the city got leveled, and ultimately the US government's involvement in all this shady shit is never going to see the light of day. And he's just like, Bloodsport's just like, look, I know it's not the ideal situation, but it's good enough. Yeah. And again, it's just like another gut punch. Like, did the good guys really win? And and that's what I liked about Bloodsport as a character is because he was kind of in between Rick Flag and Peacemaker. He He was really, like, he became a person that was devoted to his team, but Rick Flag still had that greater good mentality. And Peacemaker mm. was like absolute justice, whatever that means. Like only the means justify the, the ends. The ends yeah. justify the means. Sorry. And then Bloodsport was just like middle. I'm gonna defend my people. Uh, unfortunately, other people are gonna have to suffer, but the people I care about are gonna be fine. And that's what I'm gonna do. And I and I enjoy chaotic that neutral. Yeah, very much. 
and it's that sort of level to these characters that make this movie so worth watching. And they got released, they get airlifted out, and that's where the movie ends. Except not quite, because we get not one, but two post credit scenes. The first one is on the beach, seeing, oh no, poor little weasels, poor waterlogged drowned body. He coughs off water, gets up, and walks away like, fuck this shit, I'm out. Weasel's alive! He's been alive this whole time! Dare I hope for a spin-off? Which, good luck to Corda Maltese, because he's a child-eating monster and he's oh, released. Oh, yeah. He, he, look, they, they had the whole plane at the beginning of the movie. They're, they're like, all freaking out. Like, is he aware of it? He's like, no, no, he's harmless. Well, he's not harmless. He's eaten 27 children, but he'd be fine. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, God. And so, yeah, he's wandering off into the Corto Maltese jungle. Good for him. And then... We get a post credit scene. It's like a bunch of the tech people who narrowly avoided getting liquidated by Waller. I guess they could, she could prove nothing. Uh, basically been stuck in sh- uh, shit detail looking after someone in the hospital. Apparently they got stabbed in the heart or something. And it, the movie heavily leads you to believe that it's Rick Flagg and Rick Flagg's life. Turns out, no, it's Peacemaker. Bum, bum, bum. Peacemaker's alive. I mean, anyone who knew he was going to get a spin-off show would have seen that coming. I didn't know that, so I didn't see that coming. It's a great moment to end off of. And that's where the movie ends with... <laughs> Instead of a fuck you Marvel, it's fuck you David Ayers. That's how you do a Suicide Squad movie. And, I mean, we're going to talk about more about how we feel about this movie, but I feel like, to sum up my feelings, uh, what was that I was saying earlier? That's really dumb. But, but he's so cool! But that's so dumb! It's so cool, and it's so dumb, and I love it from start to finish. I I absolutely agree. It's such solid execution from from everybody, from direction, from writing. I I think and I and I said it before, I think that this movie was the same movie, but done better. It really was. It was it was like you kind of had like similar characters, but he wasn't afraid to commit. And that was the thing is that this movie committed. It was, it was in a long relationship with a good story. (laughs) It wasn't afraid to kill off characters and it wasn't afraid to try dumb jokes. It wasn't afraid to try dumb plot lines. It wasn't afraid. The weird thing is it's, sort of par for the course in terms of James Gunn movies. But for DC, it's so radically different. For superhero movies, actually, in general, it's kind of different. We've seen similar things in, like, Deadpool and Guardians of the Galaxy. But not in DC. To the point where I actually want to say, this is the best DC movie in the DCEU. I I can agree with that. and I Better than and- Wonder Woman. I'm going there. Because, like, Wonder Woman was great, and I love Wonder Woman, but everyone agrees that it sort of fell away by the third act. This movie is great from start to finish. Aquaman was good, but, you know, it is kind of like, okay, we're seeing a lot of different places that we don't really care about. Shazam was great, but it felt like, okay, this is something we've kind of seen before, but it's still interesting. Suicide Squad... My God, it just it constantly pushes the boat out, constantly has you second guessing yourself, but all throughout the chaotic, frenetic energy of it all finds time for genuine character growth. Yeah. And you grow to like these people. Like I when Rick Flagg died, I didn't like like I was I hated that. Like Rick Flagg dies and you feel something and you think that and you know and count and polka dot man, he dies and you're just like But what? if Rick Flagg had died in the first Suicide Squad, would you have cared? No, no, absolutely not. And and then it was such it was such a because like the original, everyone you thought was going to survive, you it survived. And this one, you legitimately like nobody said nobody expected Rick Flag to die. And I think that's fair to say. Like nobody expected no. the big money maker. He's like the pseudo the main character almost. Uh, second only yeah. to Bloodsport, really. Him and Harley being like the the big ones, and and in this one you're like, I think Bloodsport's gonna die. I think everyone's gonna die, other than Harley. Like Harley was the only sure survival for me. <laughs> oh yeah, because they wouldn't dare the the fan reaction if they killed off Harley. But you know what? That doesn't mean we don't. Just because you don't think that Harley Quinn's gonna survive doesn't mean she doesn't go through the ringer. That doesn't mean you don't enjoy her character. It doesn't mean that she doesn't have a lot of great stuff. And it just it feels more cohesive. It feels like everyone 
was in it a hundred percent. And I think it's because you had less, you know, you know, you had a better director, better script, as I said, but also you got less, you know, Jared Leto sending people dead rats. Yeah, this is only live rats that we sent in this movie. Oh yeah, only- <laughs> yeah we have, is that why we have rat catcher? Just because that's just to make up for the poor rat that is dead. <laughs> Jesus, oh Sebastian, oh my sweet baby. Oh Chris Pratt, my favorite Hollywood <laughs> actor. <laughs> oh god, it's it's just yeah, it's there's so many. It's the little details, the big details. This movie is just so rich. It's a delicious, moist chocolate cake with vanilla ice cream next to it, with a little cinnamon dusting. It it really outdid itself. I I loved every second of it. I the weak points are not even worth highlighting. I think that it just and there are they are the- there. There's um. I mean, I've never been a big fan of Alice Braga's acting, but I thought she was fine in this movie. Um, I'm struggling to think of things that I really didn't like. Um, yeah. and most I, of it is just like sort of wish fulfillment, like we were saying earlier, just like, oh, I would have kind of like if they went in this direction instead. But that doesn't mean the direction that they went in was bad. It was very good. And I think a lot of people can learn from something from this, mainly Marvel and DC. DC can learn that you could take risks, explore smaller characters, which apparently they're going to be doing with things like Blue Beetle. So that's that's encouraging. Also, Marvel shows, A, don't fire directors for stupid reasons, and B, maybe give your directors that you do have a bit more freedom. That to go off the rails a little bit and explore. Like, this movie is done really well at the box office. It's... Uh, it has... Uh, the figures I'm looking at right now at time of recording at a budget of 185 million. And so far it's doing really well. What is the yeah, actual I... box office? Let me have a look. Okay. So, so far it's it had a de- debut of roughly uh, $25 million. Um, but obviously that's due to you know, pandemic. I was lucky enough to be able to see this in the cinema. I've been trying to do that. Uh, a lot of people can't. Uh, this is the question though. Uh, Marvel and DC have been trying to offset their movies' potential loss of revenue with um, streaming services. Will we see this on HBO Go? Is it no HBO Max? Max. Max I, I, I actually, keep up. I, I'm that's sorry. Where I saw it. I, that's where I saw it. It's HBO Max. Okay, so and it's on there. So, but apparently, it's been doing really well compared to a lot of other releases uh, at the box office. So. A lot of people are saying, like, subdued or it's a bit less than expected. No, this is exactly what we expect when we have a global pandemic where some places are still locked down, some places have restrictions. Uh, We have some restrictions over here in uh, Edinburgh, so I had to watch the movie with my mask still on. But And, you know, you have to have, like, like two, three spaces in between the seats. So, yeah, it's... um, But it's still doing really well. And the response has been phenomenal in the critical department. Fans love it. Critics love it. At time of recording, it has 92% on Rotten Tomatoes. I'd be surprised if it got any less. Oh, yeah. it's I, I honestly would, too. And compared to the original one, which had like 20. <laughs> oh, yeah. I thought it was like 30-odd. But no, yeah, 20. I'm not surprised. And it, it, it's night and day. They, I mean, I, I, probably because sincerity of purpose. The original Suicide Squad had a vision however good or bad that was, but that was warped and subverted to try and fit something that it wasn't. James Gunn had a clear vision from start to finish and fulfilled it from start to finish. This isn't a movie that's one thing pretending to be another thing. It's the Suicide Squad. Nothing less, nothing more. Absolutely. It completely delivered on its premise. These are people who are going on a suicide mission and it doubled down on that. It's, yeah, it's, it's just so cool and so weird. I can't recommend enough capers. Do we have anything else to say about this movie? Um, I guess I'm excited to see where they go from here with the John Cena series, because this, this, uh, peacemaker, um, he's funny. Don't get me wrong. He's very funny and he has very good, crazy scenes, but he, for for everything else, he's not a character you want to relate to, and he's not a character you can really like go. 
Like, but the, I, he is a character that can challenge you, challenge American preconceptions about what is the cost of freedom. Yeah. And I think that could be very interesting. And if James Gunn is involved, I'm sure it will turn out great. And on that note, I think we're going to end the show. Thank you so much, Francisco, for joining me today. It was my pleasure. And if you enjoy the show, Capers, please tell your friends. Shout out from the rooftops! And if you haven't already, go back and listen to some of our other super episodes, like the previous episode Francisco and I did. What was that? What was the episode uh, you and I did? Gosh, well, we've done three now? So that's a good question. Uh, there was It was another movie review. I forget what it was. I forget what it was as well, but it's on there, Capers. I'm sorry, we've nearly done 200 episodes. Give me a fucking break. I, just... I know that I have to apologize to you, because last episode, I recommended you watch Raya, The Last Dragon, last time we did it together. And for that, and I have I... never forgiven you. And then I, I, then I heard your podcast episode about Raya, and I was like, oh no, I'm to blame. <laughs> You are indeed to blame. Send them hate mail, Capers. Do it for me. I'm joking. <laughs> don't do that. But you can listen to the show on iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, Amazon Music, or podcapers.com. If you want to get in touch with us, suggest show topics, or maybe come on the show yourself. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at AP2HYC. Thank you very much to Dan Harris for our logo, the lovely microphone, the red and blue 3D glasses. Those are mine. And thank you for listening. This has been Podcapers, the official podcast for a place to hang your cape. Cue the music!